Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Philip Paxson? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the incident, then offer my analysis. Philip and Alicia Paxson moved from Florida to Hickory, North Carolina in the summer of 2020. Hickory is about an hour northwest of Charlotte. Philip was a Navy veteran. He worked as a medical device salesman and had just been placed in charge of a sales team in North Carolina. The couple had two daughters. The family moved to the 100 block of 36th Avenue Northwest in Hickory. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. On September 30, 2022, the Paxson family attended a party in a private residence located on the 2400 block of 36th Avenue Northeast, which is about 4.3 miles from the Paxson family house. The home is located in a development called Hickory Woods. The party was to celebrate their daughter's ninth birthday and the birthday of a friend's son. Philip and his wife drove to the party separately. Alicia arrived early to put up decorations. Philip drove his daughters to the party later after getting them ready at home. When the party was over, Alicia took her two daughters back to the Paxson family house. Philip stayed behind to assist in the cleanup effort. When he was ready to drive home, he utilized the mapping software, Google Maps, to find a route. He was directed to drive over the Snow Creek Bridge. This is a small bridge in a residential area. The bridge had been washed out during a flood in July 2013. It was never repaired and had not been passable for nine years. Philip departed the home where the party was in his 2020 Jeep Gladiator. It was dark outside and raining. When Philip attempted to cross the Snow Creek Bridge shortly after 11 p.m., his Jeep plunged 20 feet into the water. The next morning, the authorities found 47-year-old Philip Paxson dead in his vehicle. He had drowned in the creek. The Jeep was upside down and partially submerged. In 2023, attorneys representing Philip's wife filed a lawsuit against Google, as well as two individuals who owned, controlled, or were otherwise responsible for the land where the bridge was located. The attorneys argued that Google Maps should have updated their software in a timely manner, and not directed Philip to drive over a bridge that was impassable. As far as the owners of the land, the lawsuit claimed that they had a responsibility to place barricades and warning signs on the bridge. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. The Snow Creek Bridge was built on private property, but intended for public use, probably as a convenience for people living in the area. The county was not responsible for the bridge, neither was the state. It sounds like when the bridge collapsed in July 2013, the owners did not have the money or the desire to repair it. In one article written prior to Philip's death, one of the owners of the land mentioned something about how the statute of limitations had expired, and he invited people to file a lawsuit against him if they disagreed. It sounds like he was saying that he didn't have any obligation to take any action regarding the bridge. Item number two, based on the description supplied in the lawsuit, it appears as though Philip approached the collapsed bridge from the northeast side. On Google Maps, when looking at the road approaching the bridge from that side, there were two orange road signs. One read, road closed 1,000 feet. The other one read, road closed 500 feet. The image capture was from May of 2019 almost three years before the tragic incident. It's not clear if those signs were up at the time Philip died. There had been barriers at the bridge at one time, but they had been removed prior to the incident due to vandalism. At the time that Philip attempted to cross the bridge, there were no barricades preventing a motorist from driving off the bridge. In addition, there were no lights in the area. I can appreciate that the barriers were removed due to vandalism, but when they were removed, why didn't whoever removed them install new barriers? Item number three, on September 22, 2020, 
two years before Philp died. A resident of Hickory used the Suggest and Edit feature on Google Maps. She wrote, quote, The bridge over Snow Creek washed away several years ago, with no plans in place to repair it. Please make this road reflect that on Google Maps so that it doesn't send people down this road, unquote. She also included a link to an article which confirmed the bridge had collapsed. Less than two months later, the same resident sent another message using the same method. She repeated that the bridge over Snow Creek had been washed away. She pointed out that emergency vehicles waste time by getting routed over that bridge. On October 10, 2022, a week and a half after Philip died, another message was sent about the bridge saying that a man was killed when he drove off the bridge. According to the lawsuit, the bridge was still listed as passable on Google Maps in April of 2023. It's worth noting that right before recording this video, I ran the directions between the two houses in question, and the bridge is no longer displayed on the route. Item number four. When Philip died, the bridge had been out for nine years. No one else had driven into Snow Creek. Philip died driving between the house where the party was held and his house. His wife drove home from the party earlier, yet made it home safely. Clearly, she did not drive over the bridge that was out. Maybe she knew the area better and didn't use the mapping software. I find it interesting that in one of the messages suggesting a change to the mapping software, the concern of emergency vehicle response time was mentioned, but not people driving off the bridge. One could argue that people in the area were not really that worried about the bridge causing a fatality. Item number five. When approaching the bridge from either side, one can see that it had collapsed. There is vegetation on both sides of the road approaching the gap, indicating that vehicles had not traveled down that way in a while. From either side of the gap, the other side is clearly visible. It doesn't make any sense that somebody would attempt to drive across the gap. Philip was driving a brand new Jeep Gladiator with modern bright headlights and the vehicle sits high off the ground. It is difficult to see the vegetation on the side from which he approached the gap, but Philip should have been able to see the other side and realize that the bridge was not passable. Item number six, it would be helpful to know how fast Philip was driving his Jeep when he was killed. In his obituary, it mentioned that he liked muscle cars, motorcycles, and dirt bikes. Maybe he was driving too fast for the conditions. The bridge was in a residential area. It was dark outside and it was raining. I don't know how fast he was driving, but considering the conditions, it would not have been advisable to drive any faster than 15 or 20 miles per hour. If Philip was driving 20 miles per hour, the stopping distance of his vehicle, including reaction time and the rainy conditions, would have been less than 80 feet. His headlights should have allowed him to see a minimum of 200 feet ahead, which was enough range to see the other side of the bridge and still stop in time. A photograph of his Jeep in the creek shows the rear of his vehicle was actually touching the other side of the bridge. This supports the idea that he was not driving slowly. His vehicle didn't lurch off the edge down into the creek. Rather, it flew off the edge. Item number seven. As far as the potential liability of the mapping software company, there are a number of reasons why any particular area of a map would not be updated. It is incumbent upon motorists to drive responsibly and be ready for conditions that deviate from what the mapping software indicates. For example, a road can be impassable because of weather, a collision, a fallen tree, or any number of reasons. The information that a motorist gathers by looking out of the windshield is more timely, relevant, and accurate than information displayed on an electronic device. Item number eight, what do I think caused this tragic death? I believe that Philip's death was caused by a combination of factors. Barricades preventing people from driving over the bridge had been removed, but not replaced. The area had inadequate lighting and signage. Philip was driving his vehicle in the dark, in bad weather, and in an area with which he was unfamiliar. He may have ignored a few warning signs that were available. Philip may have been driving too fast for the conditions, which caused the collision to be worse than it normally would have been. If he was driving slowly, the trip over the edge would have been less dangerous because his tires would have still been touching the embankment instead of his vehicle going airborne. He may have been able to escape the vehicle after it landed in the creek, 
instead of drowning. The mapping software that Philip was using directed him over an impassable bridge. Item number nine, how should the blame for Philip's death be divided in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. I believe that almost all the blame in this case rests with whoever was responsible for placing barricades at the collapsed bridge. I don't know who this is. It seems like everybody washed their hands of this bridge to nowhere. The county or the state probably should have taken responsibility because it was a public safety issue. Barricades and signs aren't that expensive. I'm surprised that residents in the area didn't vociferously complain after the barricades were removed and not replaced. As far as Philip's responsibility, when people see a road, they naturally think it can be navigated. Philip may or may not have been driving too quickly, but he reasonably believed that he could drive safely on that road. As far as Google Maps, I do not believe they are responsible for what happened. There is no way a mapping software operator can keep track of all the updates to roadways. The bridge was in safe condition at one time. Bridges don't normally collapse, and when they do, barricades and signs are placed in the area. Drivers using mapping software should know that road conditions may be different than those revealed on the software. Now moving to my final thoughts. This case features a terrible tragedy, a death that should have never occurred. It serves as a reminder that the best resource for driving safely comes from having good driving skills. Drivers should navigate cautiously, be vigilant, and never assume that others will act responsibly. Those are my thoughts in the case of Philip Paxson. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.